On April 5, the Indiana University of Pennsylvania chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists hosted a public forum on the First Amendment and the public university. The discussion addressed free speech and free press on the IUP campus. For example, the editor of the student newspaper The Pen reported that campus police have been limiting public access to public information about crimes and misdemeanors committed on the campus, a clear violation of the spirit and the letter of the laws requiring campus police to disclose public information, according to an expert on student media. More prominently, on February 28, an IUP religious studies professor removed a student from a class for what the student said were his views about gender. The professor said it was the student's behavior, not his views, that prompted her to remove him from her class. The student took his case to the media. A March 12 Fox News opinion program framed the incident as censorship at a public university. Social media erupted with predictable outrage. One week later, on March 19, IUP President Michael Driscoll aborted a campus judicial board's consideration of the case and unilaterally readmitted Engel to the class. In doing so, Driscoll alluded to FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. And as you probably know, the president said, the university is not allowed to violate his privacy rights by sharing the entirety of the matter, Driscoll said in his March 19 press conference. Driscoll cited FERPA again in a mid-semester briefing on April 16 in which he declined to elaborate on the Engel Downey classroom incident. Quote, I don't intend to speak in detail about the specifics of the situation because that would be inappropriate and potentially a violation of FERPA, Driscoll said. And in the April 5 SPJ forum, university spokeswoman Michelle Freiling cited FERPA during a discussion of university restrictions on free press responsibilities of student news media. Quote, there are some regulatory things that we just can't speak to, Freiling said. FERPA is the best example. We have to protect students' educational privacy, and we always have to do that, she said. These official pronouncements about FERPA are self-serving, misleading, or incorrect purposely to dodge discussion and debate about embarrassing issues. So says expert Frank Lomonte, one of the panelists at the April 5 SPJ Forum at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Lomonte, an attorney, an award-winning investigative journalist, former decade-long director of the Student Press Law Center in Washington, D.C., and now director of the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information at the University of Florida, compared myths about FERPA to the Wizard of Oz. So FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and um, I'll give a short version of it, but then we can do some Q&A back and forth on it. I mean, so the, interestingly enough, that FERPA is like the, the Wizard and the Wizard of Oz, where it's this giant scary monster, and then you look behind the curtain and it's a little tiny man behind it. And this is the, the image of FERPA and the reality of FERPA. And if you ask a lot of attorneys at colleges and at high schools and school districts around the country, they will tell you, because they've been badly trained, that every single thing that refers to a student is all made confidential under federal law. And that's not remotely true. <laughs> that's not remotely the case. And the U.S. Department of Education, which is the authority that enforces FERPA, has said so over and over and over again. And that guidance, as well as the interpretations of the U.S. Supreme Court, have gone completely ignored 
either because of truly bad training and bad information, of which there is quite a lot, or because of intentional overuse of the statute as a tool of secrecy and obfuscation. Um, there have been, you know, it is very commonplace at a, at a university in Kentucky. Um, the athletic department was asked to produce statistics about the number of times on which athletes receive concussions, and they said, I can't even give you the number because the number is made secret by FERPA? Wrong. Uh, in, uh, in Ohio, if you want to know how many times uh, uh, a high school had guns brought into it, how many times kids bring guns into high schools, they will tell you the number of gun incidents is protected as a confidential FERPA secret. Also wrong. Over and over and over again, colleges and high schools overuse FERPA and overcategorize things as being a matter of confidential educational privacy. So here's the reality, three things. First of all, thing number one, in the 44 years that this federal statute has been on the books, it has been enforced exactly zero times. Exactly zero educational institutions have been penalized as FERPA violators because the process as set forth by the U.S. Department of Ed is that if you were to slip up, if you were to disclose something that you shouldn't have disclosed, what happens is you get a nasty letter. That is what happens. You get a nasty letter from the Department of Ed saying, don't do that again. Only if you adopt a recurring policy and practice of continuing to do the same violation after being told not to do it can you be fined at all, and the department has never taken that step. And so the idea that somehow granting one request for public records or making one comment about some particular high-profile case is going to result in the forfeiture of money is just completely contrary to 44 years of, of history to the, uh, to the contrary. Second thing, FERPA does not cover personal observations or mental impressions. The U.S. Department of Ed has said this, so that if you are not reading something out of a student's education records, right, you're not reading it out of a document from a student's file, then you may comment on what you saw with your own two eyes. So, you know, if there is a shooting at a school, let's say, or or let's not make it depressing, let's make it something positive. You know, you have a kid who makes the Olympic team at your school and the TV station comes to interview you about the kid, you can say, oh, Sarah, my very best student, always sits in the front row, first to raise her hand, uh, uh, she's my superstar, she's going to do great things, go on to an Ivy League school, right? You can say all those things about Sarah and you haven't violated her but because you weren't reading them out of her education records. And thing number three, Three, the U.S. Supreme Court said in a 2002 case that even something as private and personal as a quiz paper that is in the hands of a teacher is not a confidential FERPA record only when those grades get memorialized in the central records repository of the school or the college does that become protected information. And so FERPA only covers that thing that remember when you were in high school you did something stupid and the principal said this is going on your permanent record, that's FERPA. FERPA covers your permanent record. It certainly doesn't cover some stray email that is living on some professor's hard drive. It certainly doesn't cover something that a professor has seen with his or her own two eyes. All that stuff is just myth and fiction that's been built up over the years. Have you guys had any FERPA experiences in your reporting uh, um, backgrounds? I guess we just make it more recent. Um, with the disruptive student situation, um, which I think George School was handling, handling very well, up until the point that he let the he uh, you know let the student back in the class.